Welcome to The Golden Shadow, the podcast about psychology, philosophy, myth, mysticism, and mystery. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Alyssa Polizzi. Welcome to our second episode. Today we're discussing the fool's journey. So the fool archetype is one that is universal because it's an archetype. Um, we see it in the tarot. The fool is the number zero in the major arcana. And the major arcana represents in some sense a journey that the fool embarks upon. What is the imagery of the tarot card? Well, we see this really striking image of what looks kind of like a youth, someone kind of um, in this young age walking on a mountainside. He's got a uh, kind of rucksack on his back. There's this white dog jumping at his feet. There are these really striking, beautiful mountains in the background. And the fool's kind of got his head tilted up to the sky and he's not really looking in any particular direction. And in front of him is this cliff face. And there's kind of this moment when you see the card of, uh, should you feel a sense of danger? Should you feel a sense of awe? Um, you know, the, this wondrous sort of beautiful scenery, um, with the possibility of, of, of a violent end that the fool is seemingly walking into without knowing. So there's this kind of interesting tension that we see within the card itself that I think kind of begins to bring us into the core of the fool's meaning. Right. It's a very dramatic card. Yeah, dramatic. It's like there's like action in the mm -hmm. card. Yeah. And the fool, the fool's not bothered by the quiff. Oh, no, no, he's not bothered. That he's staring upward. Yeah, he's not even aware of it. And that's kind of part of the feeling of the fool is that for now, all he needs to really focus on is the, the feeling of where he's moving. He's not worried about what's in front of him. He's not really worried about what's to come. If, if there is um, um, this edge that he's about to walk off of, well, maybe he'll fall to his death, but maybe he'll fly. So the fool kind of represents this notion of vulnerability or innocence mm -hmm. or openness. Yeah. Um, he perhaps is so careless because he hasn't experienced much. The world hasn't beaten him down yet, perhaps. He's not been hardened. Yeah, I would say it's um, what sort of captures it to me is this return to a childlike innocence where... The world feels full of potential and possibility. Um, but when you step into that mindset of the child, um, you know, you're not worried about how to get there or what's for dinner or how to pay your bills. It's your focus. It's very like present moment. It's very much in this sensational space where you can just kind of feel what comes next. You're being drawn by some sort of greater calling. And that's what's kind of leading you forward. Right. Being receptive. Yeah. Um, and there, there is this notion we have of children being incredibly receptive and being sponges for information and mm -hmm. soaking in their surroundings and the fool embodies this. Um, and there's a reason that the fool is the one that takes the journey through the major arcana, right? He's sort of yeah. the, the first step in some regard because he is in, in a sense, this blank slate, yeah, a blank slate of experience. And because of this openness, he is able to take the first step and complete the journey through the major arcana. Yeah, and it's important to note his number in the major arcana, which is made up of 22 cards, but are um, numbered 1 through 21 with the fool being zero. Mm -hmm. So he's not even really the first step um, on the journey itself, he is the, uh, the just the total essence of it. And as the, as the circle, as the zero, um, you can think about him as this like a mythological motif of like the cosmic egg. It's like this primordial energy where it's um, every everything that lies in potentiality, yet it's unmanifested. And so in that is uh, kind of this, um, this sort of feeling of what's to come or what is possible. And what can be created when one steps into that archetype and begins to walk the path. But the fool is, is almost like the invitation to really be in that space and kind of bring yourself back down to that simplistic level where you can trust in what's happening. Right. So the fool is 
an archetype that we can embody ourselves. Mm-hmm. It, it manifests in our lives like repeatedly this ongoing cycle of our existence, of our growth and development. We take on the fool as a, a version of self. And you can see this. You can see this in people who are trying new things for the first time or they're taking on a, a new role at their job they've never taken on before or they're learning a new skill um, or they're just in a situation that requires vulnerability. Is a, You can see people, for example, if uh, someone's going to like, get on stage to sing karaoke, this is like a very good example of this, is that people embody this silliness as a way of approaching something that scares them. And they're almost trying to take on this this version of themselves, which is one that is foolish, Mm -hmm. one that is vulnerable, but one that is comfortable being vulnerable. People get on stage to sing karaoke, for instance, and they look goofy, they may dance around, they're not very good singers, and that's part of the point is that they do this this thing that's scary for a lot of people and they get up there and everyone watches and everyone cheers pretty much no matter what even well, if yeah, you're a terrible singer like we we then uh, celebrate the person who had enough courage to go up and do something because maybe they get up there and they sound amazing and sometimes people get up there and they don't sound very good but it, you recognize this courageous leap that someone's taken and when that happens it's like the whole room is is linked together in in honoring and celebrating the person who has kind of stepped up to the plate right right so we recognize this in others we see people do it and we find it admirable um and we can see this as as part of the cycle of growth part part of the cycle of life that is repeating over and over again and you could even say there's like little micro uh, micro cycles of this nested within macro cycles where in order to embark upon a, a, a new path in which you change, in which you develop into a new person, you have to take this first step. And the mm-hmm. first step is one of vulnerability right. and risk and um, one where you might fall. Yeah. And hence the cliff for the fool right. is, is part of this notion of, of getting through life Um becoming the person you were meant to be, becoming wise, it's its not this notion of never falling. It's this notion of falling and getting back up over and over and over again. And that's yeah. what the fool does, is the yeah. fool is not afraid to fall. And just like someone who's not afraid to get up and do karaoke and fall, let's say, make a fool of themselves, yeah. they're not afraid. Because what might they find inside of themselves in that moment? Um, a sudden recognition of their own courage inside of themselves like wow well i am not a good singer but i'm up here and i realize that i i always had that ability to be vulnerable or maybe they find um this sort of uh, creative flow state of of singing the song and they feel alive they feel um sort of turned on and awakened in in this um aspect that they might not have been in touch with and so when you trust and maybe even as you fall, you start to find these inner aspects of your being that were kind of just awaiting for you to um, kind of open to them. Mm-hmm. So other examples you might be trying out a new wardrobe in front of people that know you. And you, you have a, a new outfit that you're wearing and there is some sense that perhaps you were going to look foolish in your new outfit. Mm-hmm. And um What's key in this kind of situation is that you prepare yourself to look foolish and you're okay with it. And so you can you can go meet your friends wearing this new outfit, wearing this new wardrobe, and you know like you might look like a fool. In fact, you might even decide that this wasn't a good outfit after all. But that's key to your growth is to try this thing and see what happens. And maybe you go see your friends and they make fun of you. And you say, well, I don't care. I'm wearing it anyway. This is the new me. Or maybe you say, oh, never mind. This outfit's like it doesn't actually vibe with me. And now I know. But either way, that kind of that that acknowledgement of vulnerability, of risk, and being comfortable with it, or maybe not being comfortable with, it, but 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 knowing that it's going to be okay. I mean, it's important. it's beginning to really like dive into the place where you're willing to sort of push the boundaries of what you are comfortable with, mm-hmm. and that's like a big part of the 
the appearance of the fool and what it allows us to do is to challenge our status quo. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're just talking about clothes, right? But that is this very outward expression of our personality or of our being, or maybe you just like wear the same thing every day, but maybe that's also sort of telling. So starting to, to put on this new outfit, this new costume almost is allowing you to safely approach the idea of really expanding who you are and how people see you. Right. Playing with a new version of yourself perhaps and and trying it out. I mean, and clothes is a very like literal, literal version of that, but, um, it's true that that's part of the transformation process Mm -hmm. is dabbling in a new version of yourself and that requires some vulnerability. Um, and this podcast, I'd say, is a good example of <laughs> embodying the fool. It's like this is our only, only our second episode. Um, yeah, and, we have, we have no idea what we're doing. Right, right. And so, <laughs> in in order to make this happen, there is an acknowledgement that we might look foolish, yeah, or sound foolish, yeah. Um, talking to each other, we're not rehearsing this. We have a a very small outline that we might be working with, or an idea of what we might be talking about. Um, but we're recording a conversation between us and we don't know what's going to happen and we're posting on the internet, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what kind of reception we're going to get. Yeah. And there's definitely this feeling of like, we might look stupid, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. (laughs) And if we were going to let that stop us, if it's like, well, I'm so afraid of looking like a fool Mm -hmm. that never mind, let's not do the podcast. Right. That we're actually going to stay stuck mm-hmm. almost in this like adolescent stage yeah. of like, well, no, I can't grow because it's too scary. Yeah. But instead we understand, I mean, both of you, both you and I, I think are, are people who understand this importance of mm-hmm. taking on the full archetype to yeah. try new things and acknowledging like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out. Right. And along the way, maybe I'll fall a few times and maybe people will make fun of me and you know, maybe I'll realize that this was a mistake after all. Maybe we don't want to do a podcast or something like that. Um, but part of part of the process of growth is us trying this. Yeah. And seeing what happens. Yeah, because I think we both have experience of um, embodying the fool at different times in our life and then feeling um, like all of this sort of... Uh, alignment that comes from you trusting in this process and then seeing the development happen. And then you can kind of look back and be like, well, uh, some of it really hinged on that moment where I, I trusted enough to be open that I recognized that I didn't have all the answers that I wasn't, um, educated enough yet, but it didn't matter. You know, the, the fool loves of that lack of rigidity that I think comes in very quickly as we start to kind of grow up and become adults and seek structure and all these things. The fool kind of right. comes in and just kind of knocks all those walls down. Right. Cause and children embody the fool yeah. readily. Oh right? yeah. Like, I mean, young children just run around naked. <laughs> yeah. they, they don't care. Right. And you know, are they embodying the fool or do they just not know better? I mean, e- either way, they're not afraid to, um, be vulnerable in one of these ways. The right. humans, sorry, not humans, adults, as they develop, um, and grow, they do become rigid, as you said. Yeah. And, yeah. um, an adult who's never learned how to ride a bike, for instance, mm. if they're like 30, 40, 50, whatever, and they've never learned how to ride a bike, they're much less likely as they get older to try it out because they're, they're so, they're so, um, stuck in yeah. this image of themselves as right. being in control. Right. But the notion of appearing to be out of control yeah. is terrifying to them. Right. And so that they, they won't do things as, as they get older, they'll, yeah. they'll decide, well, I, like, I can't look foolish. I can't, I, I can't expose myself. I can't look vulnerable. Right. Um, that's what the fool really does. He comes and challenges that. And, and it's when you allow it to happen, when you ease into that process, when you open to it, it's actually quite freeing. And it's a reminder almost of a space that you probably haven't been in in a long time, whether that's just focused on one area of your life or one mindset or, uh, whatever. Um, the fool kind of comes and, and liberates in a way and it can be an extremely powerful experience for people who have been resistant to it for a long time. Exactly. Liberation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why, yeah, it can be such a powerful tool for your entire life. Oh yeah. Like this, don't, don't forget that mm-hmm. this is always at your disposal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
in all different realms of your being mm-hmm. to to be able to draw out the fool and remember that you can begin again, that you can be open to a new sort of journey that's unfolding in front of you. Okay, so this pattern that we see with the fool, this sort of archetypal, universal container that we can embody is something that we see interacting with the unconscious because we see it dramatized in mythology throughout history. Um, The fool plays this important role of all of our hero stories in mythology. And mythology is this distillation of the way in which we relate with our own existence, the way in which we have this narrative, um, narrative dynamic with reality, this sort of sense of the way that we have a story that extends back into the past, the way that we have a story that will extend into the future. And that's on our minds all the time is that we are sort of part of this story, part of this bigger picture. And that we are in some sense, a avatar that is navigating this world is very much a story. And that is what mythology is speaking to is this way that we actually interpret our own existence. It's the kind of like archetypal core that's being activated and then dramatized narratively into the external world for us to share through tradition um, and trying to make sense of our existence or what we're sort of meant to do in the world. You know, the, the mythology, these sort of ancient stories often seem like explorations and what it means to be human, even when they have these seemingly like supernatural elements, they all kind of tie back into the experience of the hero and what's going on. And, and there's this sort of, um, this pattern, this tie, whether that's, um, a story that we're getting from ancient Greek mythology or ancient Egyptian, or even modern day, there's this, um, constant, of the hero and certainly that that aspect of the fool is embedded in the hero himself hmm. yeah the uh the initial stage of the hero's journey which is where the hero is living some kind of sheltered existence or um before he has received the call to adventure before he has um picked up the sword and walked out of his village let's say to go slay the dragon there's this initial stage of the hero's journey, which is this um, nascent adolescent phase almost where the hero um, is safe. The hero is sheltered. The hero might be innocent. They might be inexperienced. They might not understand the nature of the outer world, the nature of evil, the nature of chaos. And they, um, they're yet to leave home. And you can see this, the, the most obvious examples for us are going to be in our pop culture, which is still the, the, the stories we, we have movies about the stories that we, we see in our popular books are still mythological. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not, that's not something that's separated from this notion of like Greek mythology. It's like, it's all tapping into this, this same aspect of our psychology. And so, um, the, the Lord of the Rings, for example, is a, of course, very popular, very well-known story. And the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings starts with the hero, which is Frodo. Mm-hmm. And um, we recognize Frodo as, as the hero immediately. It's not like some mystery that needs to be unraveled. It's like, it's not flashed on the screen. This is the hero. We just know he's the hero for some reason. We're rooting for him. We like him. Um, there's something about him that we want to know more about and follow. He, he grabs us. And it's because he embodies this archetype very strongly of the hero. And when he's still in the Shire, he's the fool. This notion of, of the inexperienced, um, the innocent, adolescent, the, the person who has not yet taken the, state, taken the step into the unknown. And so Frodo's, the Shire is safe. It's clearly depicted as individuals who are small. They're not warriors. Um, they farm and eat and drink and 
smoke their pipes and they have parties and they're kind of seen as just very um, simple, innocent folk. And uh, Frodo um, could stay in this situation forever if he wanted to. Um, and he probably would if he didn't receive the call in some regard in the form of Bilbo's reign, right? And so this call to adventure is what takes Frodo out of this adolescent phase of being the fool. And um, we like this story because we know that Frodo is a fool archetype, a blank slate type character of experience. And he's going to go through this transformative experience by venturing out into the unknown, venturing out into danger. Yeah, despite being at this sort of basic level of innocence and childlike quality, we also recognize that within him is this inherent archetypal potential of what could be or of what someone of seemingly, um, you know, low powers, especially in such a fantastical place as the Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, he he even in, in being um, a hobbit, you know, not a wizard, not an elf, still um, holds some sort of ancient truth inside of him, which is when you are willing to believe and anchor into and open up to some sort of transformative element within, you have the power not just to affect yourself, but also the world. And that's really what Frodo does. He he carries on his back this immense weight of responsibility. But if he knew what it really meant in that moment of taking the ring, certainly he wouldn't have. Um, there is the feeling of what the fool represents in his lack of knowledge in that right now you're, uh, you're safe. Like your, your, your psychology is safe of, of from knowing everything that's coming your way. And in, in many ways that's happening all the time in our life. You know, we don't know what's going to happen when we walk out the door. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen when we decide to go on a trip to Europe or whatever. But if we knew every little, you know, success or every challenge that was going to come our way, we would try to control it. Um, we would try and manufacture it. And um, here we see that that innocence factor is really what um, is laying open the space for Frodo to become uh, the savior of, of, of the story. Right, right. And he's in, in some sense, he is the most powerful character of the story. Yeah. Right. Like, as you said, like he's not a warrior, he's not a wizard. It's mm -hmm. like, you have like Aragorn, who's like this like sexy man yeah. who like lives in the chaos of the wild. Right. He's the king. He's the king. Right. <laughs> and he, and he's moving. Of course, like we love Aragorn, but like Frodo as the fool mm -hmm. character, the one who is the most sheltered and right. the most vulnerable and the one who takes on the biggest burden. Right. Um, that's very powerful to us and we like that and, yeah. and we actually like we cheer that on we want Frodo to succeed yeah. we are moved by what happens to him um and he he is very much the fool in the sense that like he falls off a cliff right yeah real big cliff real big cliff <laughs> he, he, he takes the ring and he's just like the fool like whistling to himself looking up in the sky and there's a cliff right in front of him yeah. and Frodo does not realize what is about to happen to him and yet he he does it anyways. Yeah. He moves forward. Yeah. Um, he um, changes in a way that he cannot go back. Right. Right. So this, this entire journey inflicts so much experience upon him that he is forever changed. Yeah. Um, and that story is what we like to see. Right. So like, that, that's the vehicle of development that we actually need, because if someone was to go through such an experience and still be the same person, I don't think it would feel very exciting to us. It wouldn't it wouldn't strike that archetypal core. Right. Within. Right. It just part of us would even say, like, well, that's not believable. Right. And it's like we would say, well, it's not a good story. Yeah. I don't like it. That's boring. Right. And so, <laughs> you you know, we we don't necessarily question this formula that we no. see in these stories, the way they're depicted, we just like, oh, well, that's just it. It's, I liked, I liked that story. Yeah. And I was like, well, why did you like it? It's like, well, I don't know. And it's like, well, feels right. There's something about it that feels right, and yeah. something that feels right is the fool taking the step into the unknown, even though he might die, even though something terrible might happen to him. Yeah. And he does something that changes the world for the better. He brings yeah. a new order to the world, and in doing so, he changes himself. He or she, 
I should say. Yeah. Um, and we like this story very much. And, and you can imagine if the Lord of the Rings had been written a different way and let's say Frodo had just taken the rain and thrown it in a pond and stayed in the Shire just baking cakes and <laughs> drinking beer with Sam. Um, that's not nine hours that we'd want to watch. Right. We, we no. would, we would take that story and be like, well, this, this is a stupid story. I don't like it. Um, and you know, if Frodo had not saved the world for some reason, if he had failed in a way that was just like, Oh, well the world is just completely unchanged by what he did. And then he died. We also don't like that story very much either. <laughs> no. It's like, well, no, where's like, where's, where's the arc? Where's the, where's the change that happens where the world is improved? Um, and, uh, you know, something unrealistic had happened to Frodo where he like, uh, became like a dragon knight and mm -hmm. had like crazy magic powers. That also is the kind of thing that's like, well, that doesn't seem like realistic change. And so right, we're, right. We're, at, we're actually tracking this story in a way that we are looking for something to be depicted. Yeah. We, we desire the transform transformation to mm -hmm. happen. It's that transformative element that I think actually speaks to some deeper inner desire in our spirit and in our psychology that, that yearns for, uh, just this, uh, this growth of self for people to kind of move through these cycles of change and, and transformation. And even when we look at some other examples, you know, maybe the hero in the story doesn't start out as, you know, um, a simple villager. You know, you can look at, um, the Odyssey as an example mm. where our hero, um, Odysseus is a king already, mm -hmm. right? King of Ithaca, mm -hmm. a war hero. And yet he is, um, through his journey, through this epic, someone who's seemingly on top of the world, who has everything, you know, mm -hmm. child, wife, kingdom, all mm -hmm. of these things, is brought down to the level of like the layman in a, in a, in a way. Like yep. he, he has to be reintroduced into what it means to have nothing again, mm. to know nothing, to be challenged, to to have to transform and push himself through all of these um, upheavals. Right. So in some sense, him being a king is a sheltered existence. Almost, exactly. Right? Exactly. Like, he has all this stuff. He has all this material yes, wealth. Yes. He's powerful and he's in control. Yeah. And he's reduced to being the fool. Yes. He, yes. he loses things. And it's like, well, you have a huge, huge undertaking ahead of you and you need to step forward and take it um, because there's no other choice. And that's what he does. And the mm -hmm. story is compelling for that reason. Right. And he experiences so much loss yes. throughout his journey. Yes. And he changes so much. Um, but it's compelling. Right. Uh, we wouldn't want to read the Odyssey if it's just like, it's like, uh, Odysseus, like the playboy king, like right. just like him, just like doing king stuff. Yeah. It's like, well, we don't really care about that. Yeah. Um, and so this is interesting because the, these stories, we see these stories and we like it and we cheer it on and we say, yes, that's what you should do. You should be a hero and you should step out into the darkness and you should let the world change you and you should change the world and you should yeah. have this ongoing dynamic relationship where you are constantly being pushed and pulled by the world and you are pushing, pushing and pulling the world mm -hmm. and you change the world as it changes you. Yeah. And we like, when we like seeing that in stories and yet the stories don't reflect our daily life in a way that we recognize. Certainly not. We're just like, well, you know, nothing Lord of the Rings has to do with my real life. It's like, you know, it's like there's a dark Lord it's like we recognize in some sense, like the idea that there is some crazy dark Lord that's made these magic rains. It's like, well, that seems a little like far fetched, but we don't care in the story. It makes sense. Right. But we have trouble transferring it back over into real life. Right. And that's, what's so interesting is that the unconscious is speaking when it likes the story mm -hmm. and it's saying there's something to learn here. There's, yeah. there's something important happening here, which is why you should pay attention, which is why you should pay $12 to see this movie. <laughs> which is why you should see like the same story depicted over and over and over and right. over again, where you know it's going to happen. In fact, if something different happens on the hero story, it's yep. like you don't like it. We get upset. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, what do you, what do you mean the hero, the hero just gets killed right. and the villain wins? It's like, we don't like that. It's like, yeah, but you've seen the same story over yeah. and over again. It's like, well, I want to see the same story. That's the Game of Thrones twist right in the heart. Right. You know. Right. And yet 
<laughs> that's that is that is the genius of Game of Thrones, and, and yet still yes. Game of Thrones ends with like our heroes in some sense. The the spirit of the Starks succeeds. Yes, right. You you don't ever actually get to fully move away from the hero's journey mm-hmm. unless you're just really trying hard not to <laughs> right. go there. Right. So the uh, the kind of shadow aspect of here, if we're, if we're talking about the golden shadow, mm-hmm. we're talking about getting into this sort of. Uh, um, unconscious realm that is invisible to us where there is so much untapped potential. Yeah. Um, p- part of that here is recognizing that the the hero's journey is something that our unconscious is trying to tell us that we should be doing in our life. Yeah, and we might feel sort of disconnected from it because we don't have, you know, a fantastical um, elements in our life mm-hmm. that make us feel like we're we're in the story itself. Mm. You know, we don't have gods who are exacting their will on us or being sent on journeys to slay dragons or mm. things like that. Um, but I think the actual um, connection to that is in the the space of our dreams and the unconscious realm that loves and just breathes that sort of archetypal, symbolic, mythological space. And that's why I really think that we see the hero's journey depicted in this way, why we see mythologies depicted as they, as they are, that's mm-hmm. because it's speaking to um, a, a sort of unconscious language that is embedded in each of us as, as humans. And mm-hmm. so we can step into this um, mythological and archetypal realm when we dream at night. And it's like, wow, in my dreams, I did actually slay a dragon. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, what does the dragon actually represent? Right. You know, is it really this fantastical creature yeah. or does it maybe represent a deep challenge inside of yourself in your life? And that's what's so interesting about the dream interpretation and connecting these symbolic elements um, to the the material reality that we're all living in is that actually we we have an access point to um, this this drama, this narrative drama, and we can recognize that yes our lives feel a little bit mundane but actually we can embody the hero we can embody the fool we can see it represented in these different layers of our being um just by becoming more conscious and more aware of what's going on right and actually recognizing that there are calls to adventure in our life repeatedly that we are ignoring and um that's why embodying the fool is so important is that there actually are lots of opportunities coming at us constantly for change Mm -hmm. for growth yeah. And we have this tendency to ignore them or we have a tendency to block them out or we might say it's just too much trouble. Yeah. Or it's scary. Yeah. And that's that's how these things are and 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 you know, we might we might be in a situation where we have a career and we we've come to the conclusion that we do not like our career. Right. And we're not happy and we're not growing. Mm-hmm. And there's this notion of perhaps I should quit and take a leap of faith and yeah. and embark on a new career. Yes. And if you were to truly think to yourself, well, what would Harry Potter do? <laughs> or, you know, uh, what would Luke Skywalker do? Right. What would, what would, what would these heroes do? Right. It's like, they take the leap of faith. Right. Like we know that. Yeah. Um, this, this whole notion of like, well, what would, what would, what would Harry Potter do? Would he just like stay under the stairs? Yeah. It's like, no, he doesn't want to stay under the stairs. Right. It's like, but it's safe there. He know, he knows under the stairs. Right. He can, he can stay there and he's, he'll, he'll, he'll be fine. It's like, no, but you know that Harry should go to Hogwarts. You know that he should go fight Voldemort. Yeah. And it's like, but what if he gets hurt? It's like, we're not really asking that question for the story, but for ourselves, we ask that question. Right. We say, but it's dangerous. Right. We say, uh, it's scary. It's scary. What will happen to me? What if I fall? And it's like, you will fall. Yeah. That's what happens. But you, you have to take that leap of faith anyways. And that you find that if you actually interpret life in this way of, the unknown is something that you should venture into repeatedly um, in order to overcome this darkness in your life, this adolescent phase that you are, that you might find yourself in, and to become the person you are meant to be. That is what the, the hero's journey is, is telling our unconscious. That is what the full archetype is telling our unconscious, is that this is how you should live. Yeah, and I think it's easy to cheer on the heroes of other stories or even the heroes um, in our life, the other people we see walking the hero's journey. Mm. Like, wow, they're so brave, you know, 
Harry, of course he's going to do it. He's going to be a wizard. But me, I'm just a regular old IT guy. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm not special. Mm-hmm. I don't really have much that I can offer to the world. Mm-hmm. When we get wrapped in this uh, limiting sort of subjective experience, we cut ourselves off from this um, archetypal experience of, mm-hmm. of transformation and mm-hmm. change. And, and I think that's the question that might help people um, kind of realize, you know, um, am I, am I closing myself off because I'm not able to quite look outside of my experience and see, uh, the ancient truth that exists even in the mundane reality of my life, because maybe you do choose to take the leap of faith and you get a new job and that sets you on this grand adventure, um, that ends you in a place that you had no idea. Um, and you're much more well off in all these different ways because of it, because you trusted it. Um, and I think often we we limit ourselves because we don't see the hero within, the fool within. Right. And we are all heroes with our own story, mm-hmm. no matter what that story is. And if you can't see that, then it's time to dive into the shadow. It's time to look at your life and say, what is the dragon that I need to slay? Yeah. What is the adventure I'm on? Yeah. Um, what is the abyss I find myself in? Yeah. And uh, how can I embody the fool? Let's say, understand my vulnerability, understand the potential for risk, understand the potential for falling and know that like, that is the only path that leads to, um, the manifestation of the person that you were meant to be. Yeah. The treasures, right. That which you seek. Mm Mm-hmm. The, the boons of the adventure, which hopefully in the mundane reality is happiness and um, realization and contentedness and a sense of uh, of really living the life that you want to live and not one that you're just resigned to live to. One of our audience members, Captain Streambane. It's his real name. His real name <laughs> has written into us with a dream that he would like us to analyze. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Mm, go ahead. Sinking in a body of water. At first, I panic. And like any other underwater dream, I can physically feel like I'm holding my breath. I see the sunlight on the surface above and the darkness below as I sink. I hear myself think, it's okay, breathe. When I take a breath, I feel peace almost instantly. And as I sink, I see a tiny orange octopus float towards me and in my euphoric state, all I can think is, how beautiful. So this is um, a very interesting dream to have been submitted to us because I think it does a really nice job of showcasing some very collective archetypal elements that we seem um, that show up in the dream space and um, our audience member Captain Stringbean kind of mentioned wanting to understand you know what's happening when one's engaging in deeper inner work and starting to see uh, vivid dreams ones that really stand out ones that feel um, very memorable as they awaken and so we touch upon this idea that as we venture deeper into ourself that the unconscious, which we sort of access in the dream realm might speak back to us, might offer some symbolic wisdom. And so here in this dream, we're dealing with this large body of water. So symbolically, we think a lot of water as the unconscious inner realm. It's incredibly deep. We can kind of see the surface the light of that, um, the light of our consciousness is kind of what exists on that very surface level of like the ocean. But we also understand that there's this incredible depth and, and in that there it's there's darkness. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a kind of fear that comes with it too, certainly. We, we start entering into that shadow realm where there's um, kind of an, an uncertainty that makes you not want to dive too deeply. And so if one is beginning to do this deeper inner work, 
um, to have this expression of uncertainty being expressed in the dream realm um, is something that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that anyone who's beginning to do this, to walk that path, might have a similar dream where we're accessing a, um, a, a, f- a sort of um, symbolic imagery that is taking us deeper and deeper. And we feel his in- initial anxiety here. Um, he feels like he can't breathe underwater. Um, what's he going to do if he sinks? Is he going to die? Um, and as he looks up, as he's sinking, he sees the light on the surface and the darkness below. And so he's moving further and further away from what he's aware of, what his consciousness has access to, and deeper into this place where he needs to explore. Right. So this is a fairly straightforward sounding dream. Yeah, I would say so. I would say it's very symbolic in a very powerful, iconic way. Mm -hmm. There's not this sort of sense of like fantastical chaos I feel like which is common to certain dreams Mm -hmm. so suspended in water there's a lot going on there of course water does have this representation for us as being something that is full of life but also full of darkness and full of like infinite mystery yeah mystery Um, there is a notion of of water being sort of a chaotic sort of representation Mm mm-hmm of the world that's definitely how it's depicted in mythology yeah as being both can, life and chaos right can pull you in grab you by your feet and, and be dragged under the surface mm, yeah but it's also what makes you know life grow and yeah. it's what you drink to survive yeah um, life giving right um but um being suspended in water i think is pretty universal it's something that makes people feel uncomfortable the notion that you are drowning is definitely not a um not a feeling that people want to experience in a dream but strangely he's not experiencing drowning no in fact he breathes he realizes he has a sort of uh moment of realization that you can kind of ease into this uncomfortable experience sort of breathe it in and what he finds is he's like he acclimates to it it's kind of like he's becoming of the sea or of the water itself of the darkness of the unknown by breathing it in instead of rejecting it and of course in in any regular sense we would we would die right we couldn't breathe in um the water if we were drowning but in in this space of of the, of the symbolic world, we get access to um, opening ourselves up to something that feels life-threatening. Right. So this, this ties in nicely to the discussion of the fool. Yeah. This, this, this imagery of someone being immersed in chaos mm-hmm. or the unknown or darkness or mystery and finding yet a sense of ease, a sense of comfort. Yeah. And being okay with this suspension in something that you do not understand. Yeah, there's and, a there's an openness now to the experience of what's right, happening instead right. of fighting it or turning away or, you know, swimming back up to the surface and getting back in your boat. Mm-hmm. And what happens when he opens to the experience, when he eases into it, when... Um, he kind of humbles himself to to be taken in by what's happening, then something starts to emerge from the depths. Hmm. Something maybe that seems like it could be a monster or a helper. Who knows? It's just something's kind of emerging from that place. And as it gets closer, he sees that it's this um, tiny orange octopus, which I think is a, an interesting image to hold in one's mind. Um, both that we have a, a sort of dualistic representation of, 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 of the sea monster, um, literally in the mythologies, right? Like we think of like the Kraken. Right. Some, this, something the, uh, the ocean could send forth from yeah, the depths. Right. It's like what, what could the, uh, the belly of the planet, like this like chaotic core send forth. Yeah. And it's like, it could be the Kraken mm-hmm. that demolishes your boat or yeah. your city. But instead, it's just this friendly octopus. Yeah, almost. This yeah, it's like what? What is the unconscious doing to you in this place of shadows? It, what is it saying to you? And it's sending forth almost this um, this sign of peace yeah. or 
or like a little helper or hope. Yeah. Almost like the equivalent of like a little like golden bird. You, if yeah. you were out of the water, it might be like, Oh, like there's potential or mm-hmm. there, there's hope or there's beauty. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. I think the color it was what you're tapping into the mm-hmm. golden, the, this orange octopus. I'm, I'm thinking a lot and connecting that to this sort of yellow, orangey golden, um, color that usually represents a sort of consciousness in, um, you know, like the, the halo of consciousness that we see around like saints or religious figures, this right. idea that this sort of bright color lights the darkness. And that's literally what's emerging from the depths is something, um, in, in, in your being that might be an offering something that you can utilize a tool, um, a part of yourself that's coming to the surface that then can emerge and become more powerful. And so it's not a scary monster with a dark, intense color. It's something that's still of that world. You know, the octopus certainly lives in the depths of the ocean, but it's inviting. Um, and so I think that that is more of an expression from the unconscious realm of, of the offerings and the, the boons that the treasure laying deep within that can be accessed in this space. Do you have a question for us? Do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze? Are you curious about the meaning behind a certain symbol, character, or archetype? Is there a topic you'd like us to cover? We want to hear from you. Contact us through the submission form, which can be found at our Instagram page at Golden Shadow Podcast. Or if you're listening on YouTube, you can find the link in the description below. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. These podcasts are only possible with the support of viewers like you. Thanks for listening. See you later.